Hey, I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> I lost you for a minute. I think I was talking by myself. I don't know where. <laughs> I, I always do that. Point is, we are here again. Uh, yes. Okay, so if you could give us a, a little introduction of yourself. Okay, um, I just want to say to the audience, if I start talking to Sandra in Greek, I will correct myself. Because I'm normally used to talking to her in Greek. So if I go off tangent, just say that. Um, my name is Elena Anadolis. I am a Greek-American 36-year-old woman with cerebral palsy. Um, I'm a daughter, a sister, a granddaughter, a disability advocate, patient advocate, speaker, and whatever else goes. <laughs> <laughs> Published writer, and so on. Oh my god, that's that's a lot. Where should we start from? Like maybe you pick a topic and then we can we can choose which which topic would you like first from all I don't those? I talk a lot about the topics. Uh, <laughs> so, what, what about listening? Cassandra and I had a lot of conversations as to what we're going to talk about, and we're still trying to figure it out. So, no, I mean, I I want us to start from the basic, which is. Tell us exactly what this condition is, because as I told you also, it's something that I actually was looking uh, up because I found uh, this other guy, which is in UK, and he has the same condition. I was like, oh, okay, what is this? Like, let me find out and stuff. So it's pretty new to okay. me. So does Ashley. Ashley oh. has the same, same condition. But what I did uh, when I was I was looking up things is that there's not only let's it's there's i think there's four categories okay so cerebral palsy is a neuromuscular disorder that affects movement um there's four categories i don't know the top the categories off the top of my head that's um, fine but it's it's more of an umbrella term because cerebral palsy is the main disability and then you have other comorbid disabilities that go along with it me personally i have cerebral palsy spastic uh, diaplegia, which means Greek word. It affects both my legs too. So okay. both legs. Um, and then along with that, I have um, fine motor skill issues. I have a little ADD, which they say is from the cerebral palsy, but mm -hmm. I think it's hereditary because my father has ADD and so does my mother. Um, I have a few learning disabilities. Again, that's hereditary also but it could be part of the CP also. Um, my mom has learning disabilities. I have strabismus, mm -hmm. which is, could be a comorbid um, condition with cerebral palsy. So it's just an umbrella term. And then under all that comes all these other things. Uh, so is it something that it's passed? Because as you said that, you know, you, you, you had some that you took from your parents, but uh, is it something that goes through generations? Like, is it no. something that you pass on? So, so when I say that I have ADD and learning disabilities and certain things because of my parents, it just so happens that my parents have it, mm -hmm. but it can also be something that you have because it's cerebral palsy. So we really don't know if it's the CP or the parental hereditary thing i personally my own personal opinion is i have certain things because my parents but because of the difficulties that i have like the fine motor skill issues and things like that and the fact that i do things a little slower because of the cp it just makes it more apparent okay okay because i saw um I mean, all the research that I've done through uh, Google is, you know, it could be from like birth, it could be, you know, this, it gives you like different results. So oh, mine and my sister's, because I'm going to do a comparison, my late sister, who you know, but our viewers don't know, who passed away about two and a half years ago, um, both had cerebral palsy. Um, we were on opposite ends of the spectrum, which means I walk with two canes, I'm verbal, um, cognitively, um, I'm able to learn maybe a little differently, but I'm able to learn. I have a undergrad degree. I'm going to grad school where on the other hand, she was a quadriplegic, which means she had no use of her, 
um, legs or arms. She depended on everyone to do every single part of her um, daily, daily living activities. Um, <clears throat> she did understand and she'd let you know that she understood. She was bilingual. Um, her main language was Greek. Um, and she could, she would dance to her Greek music. <laughs> and if she didn't like something, she'd spit in your face. Um, but she was, she was on the opposite end. So she couldn't do anything by herself. Um, she had, I'll give you an example. She had, um, she had an intellectual disability. Mm -hmm. Um, basically she used half of her brain because the other half was damaged. She had epilepsy, blindness. Mm -hmm. and the quadriplegia so the epilepsy blindness quadriplegia she was nonverbal in the in in society's definition we yeah. understood her so it varies so cp is the umbrella term and then everything else comes under that mm -hmm. um what i also read is that it's something that is not progressive correct it's not progressive, but if you don't keep up with, if you're not able to keep up with uh, therapies like stretching and things like that, your movement as you get older, like everyone else, whether you have a disability or not, as you get older, things get more difficult. Hmm. But it's not, it doesn't get worse. You get tighter. Yes. And happen but that happens to everyone whether you have a disability or not if you're getting older and you're not moving mm -hmm. in your yeah, life sure. it happens you don't use it you lose it so <laughs> uh, so how often do you the do part you... of life yes that's true that's that's how it works For unfortunately at some point in, at some point in everyone's lifetime they will have a disability we just mm. society just categorizes different categorizes it differently so it's me or someone else with a disability who has something from birth i think we're just a little more equipped for it <laughs> yes no i understand what you mean i usually when you can see something is worse for society yeah because uh that's when they will label you straight away or like when we hear so many um things as people that that have like some like a disability or something and you know they might park in a disabled parking and they're like why are you parking there like you're not disabled but you know you have the ones that are visible and you also have the ones that are not and right that's why obviously oh, we... i think it's i think it's scary because they actually see it and i see this all the time with my sister and she knew this and it took me a long time to come to terms with my disability that was just a journey like a complete you know, journey. I didn't come, I will, I don't think I'll ever come to terms with it, but fully to accept it in order for me to realize what my life's purpose is. I didn't come to accept it until I was 26. And I loved my sister, but I didn't like her because she was a, she was a mirror image of what I used to be. And that scare, at first of all, as a little kid, that scares you. As a human being, we're afraid. I see society is afraid of disability. So imagine what it was like for me because I used to be physically like her. I had no use of my hands, no use of my arms, could only roll to get around. You had to help me sit up. You had to help me use my hand. I couldn't even put a crayon in my hand. You had to put the crayon in my hand, close my hand and do the motion for me. So she was a mirror image of what I was, and if I didn't work hard enough, what I could become. So it was a constant daily reminder. That was something that I struggled with <clears throat> on my journey, you know. How, how did you manage uh, from that level that you were to reach where you are now? Like, is it a lot of physio? Like, how does it work? Physically or psychologically? Well, let's say both. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, physically, I did everything under this. First of all, I had what's called a selective dorsal rhizotomy, which is what they do is I was very tight. You, you couldn't even, like, move my arm. So what the selective dorsal rhizotomy did was it loosened everything up and made me, like, jello. 
And then back How then. How does that work, though? Is it, is it... Uh, they cut the nerve endings. So it's, a, it's an operation? Yeah, surgery. surgery. Where they yes. cut the nerve endings in the spine. And back when, when rehabilitation was actually therapy, you know, when they actually, like, did hands-on stuff and it wasn't a matter of how quickly they can get you out. I did six months of th- in hospital therapy. And then when I came home, I continued from there. I did, um, as I got older, I continued th- physical therapy three times a week. I was in the pool twice a week. I had a personal trainer another three times a week. Um, I went swimming. I went skiing. Skiing? Yes, yeah, skiing. So okay. they have a they have a special ski program up in um, New York, upstate New York, where they have a ski instructor and a physical therapist, and they have canes, crutches, and a walker with skis on them, and they evaluate you and they see what works. So they put the skis on my legs, and I couldn't do the canes or the crutches because I need more support. So they gave me one of those, you know, the old lady walkers, <laughs> yes, with, with skis on the bottom. Okay, I've and never said this. I went up and down the mountain um, four times. Wow. And then after that, after that, my hip dislocated, but it wasn't because of the skiing. It was, I had my, uh, my, I had hip problems from a very young age, but my doctor didn't want to do anything until it was time. Like it was the last straw. And I guess that just moved it along. <laughs> So he fixed it, and now there's no way my hip will ever pop out of the socket. But yeah, so now you can go skiing again. <laughs> yep, I can go skiing again. <laughs> uh, so now, how often do you do physio? Is it something that needs to be done like every week? Is for it me, a monthly? For me, Sorry? yeah. For me, it is. For me, it's like breathing. Breathing. It's like air. Um, because my physical therapist does stretching, things that I can't do because I can't, I don't, I stretch by myself, but I can't feel certain things when I do them. Like, I don't feel them as intensely as if someone else was doing them for me. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm a little afraid. Um, he also does neuromuscular re-education, um, which means he puts electrodes on my leg. Mm -hmm. and makes my leg move in certain ways and opens up pathways for my body to be able for my leg to be able to move a certain way that took him two years to do for one particular body part and then i because of that i was able to get a brace a cuff that sends a signal to the leg basically it shocks me and it makes my leg go up and down Because sometimes when you have cerebral palsy, you stomp. You don't do that. The <clears throat> the ankle movement, yeah. which is called dorsiflexion. So you don't do the heel toe. This makes me do the heel toe. So every time I step my foot down, it goes, it electrocutes me basically. Yeah. And says, Elena, remember, heel toe. But what that also does, it helps me put more weight on my left side, which is my weaker side. Okay. And gives me more stability. And I walk faster and I do things quicker. Uh, so you, okay, all right. So like in, if you continue, which I'm guessing you will, <laughs> continue yeah. this physio, uh, let's say in five years, you can see like a huge improvement. There's always going to be improvement, but physical therapy, at least for me, speaking, from and whatever I say on this live, I'm just gonna put it out there. It's my experiences. I'm yeah. not speaking I'm not speaking for the disability community or the cerebral palsy community. These are just my experiences and my takeaways mm-hmm. from the experiences that I've had with myself and other people when I speak. Um for me, um it's gonna be forever. I'm not going to stop it because it makes me feel better. Yes, and as you say, I mean, even someone that doesn't have, uh, like, I mean, any disability, just growing older, you you are going to have issues with your body because that's how it is. That's the natural, that's the natural way things go. Yeah. 
Yes. Um, what I want to ask you now, because you, we're talking about physio, how does, like, obviously you need it, so it's not something that, oh, okay, if I don't do it, oh, never mind. Is it something that you have to pay, or does the government pay in the United States? Me, personally, um, I pay for it out of pocket. Okay. Yes. Because, <laughs> because I am because I am privileged enough to be able to do so. Okay. And I've decided that I've decided that that's where my part of my money and my income is going to go. That was a that was a personal choice. In terms of everyone else um as far as the United States and Medicare and Medicaid, mm -hmm. they only pay 20 visits per year. If they if you have a proper diagnosis that they agree with. That's bad, though. Right. So in the United States, there's no preventative medicine. 20 visits. That's like, like okay, I don't know, maybe one or two a month. Right. Uh-huh. But that's really bad because that's not going to help in any way. I mean, even if... Whether you have private insurance or, or Medicare or Medicaid, they have a cap. Cap. Which I think is part of the reason why, and again, this is from my, you know, opinion, yeah. part of the reason why people with disabilities are in the spot that they are physically, emotionally, <laughs> just yes. everything, you know, because it's, 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 you need it. It's liter literally for someone like me, it's like w water. Hmm. Like now I haven't had physical therapy in a week because the office was closed. It's not that bad, but I'm tight and I feel it. I haven't gone to the gym since COVID because I won't go for like my own reasons, but there's a major difference. Even, even though I have physical therapy, you know, twice a week, the combination of the personal training and the physical therapy, I see a difference, a difference in stamina, a difference of, in endurance, a difference in fatigue, which are also things that come along with having a physical disability. Mm -hmm. um, so you just need to move. <laughs> I'm, I'm just surprised that, the, I mean, I don't know how it works here, to be honest, in, in the UK. But I think I spoke with this about, with uh, Ashley, and in a couple of lives, because a lot of the people that I do lives are from the, from the States. And they always tell me, all these negative things about how the government works for people with uh, disabilities. And it's just so disappointing to see that because it's not only the States, it's in general. I mean, even in Greece. Like, you know how things are in Greece. I mean, yes. obviously you have family well, and everything. Well, we're not valued. We're not seen as productive members of society. That I can say. We're not. We're not valued at all. So... How do you think, like, what would help to change that? That requires a, a systematic change. That's a whole, that's a whole changing of the system. I mean, I mean, as an advocate, that's my goal. <laughs> It's a big one, but that's my goal. Um, but you have to start small um, by educating the doctors and actually finding doctors who are willing to care for and listen to people with disabilities. That's a big issue. Most of my doctors having to do specifically with my cerebral palsy mm -hmm. are pediatric doctors. How does that work? <laughs> I've had up until my, my, up until my wonderful doctor who moved to, uh, pediatric um, orthopedist moved to China Dr. David Roy, one of, who's one of the best doctors in the entire world. I love him. Um, up until he moved to China, he was still my doctor. He's been my doctor since I was three. Okay. Um, most physicians don't know or don't want to care for people with disabilities. Um, I don't know if it's they find it overwhelming. They find it scary. It's too much work. I, I don't know. They don't. It's not. It's not textbook, so it's not easy. Um, so that's where, as an advocate, that's where I'm starting. Um, and I'll give you an example. We, <clears throat> when my sister got sick, 
Um, she was in and out of a particular hospital in New York for about six, six years on and off. Mm -hmm. And we fought. I wrote letters. My parents were there every day. We fought with administration because they weren't looking at her as a human being. They were looking at her diagnoses. And they're like, well, this isn't textbook normal. And I was like, yeah, but this is Elizabeth normal. Um, so what they're actually doing, um, we did change the system. We changed protocols. And I only know that because I've heard from parents of people who are like Elizabeth we actually met in the hospital, Greek families. And they said, you know, my daughter went into the hospital and this and this happened. And I know the same thing happened to Elizabeth, but they did this differently. Thank you for what you did. If it wasn't for Elizabeth, they wouldn't have known what to do. So when I see something like that, I'm like, okay, these people are listening. I might have had to write six letters and fight and argue, but, but they listened and they did something and they're still doing something. Whether, even if it's just for one person, they remembered what they did with my sister and they applied it to this girl. So what I'm doing, <clears throat> I asked them um, if they would be willing to do an annual lectureship grand rounds where they get all the doctors together and they talk in memory of Elizabeth and they talk about who Elizabeth was as a human being and a patient and what they did right and what they did wrong to educate their staff. A yearly event. Mm -hmm. And they said they're going to do it. I yes. wasn't expecting that actually. <laughs> they, they, they said that they were going to do it. And I, last week I actually met with the fundraising department who I've worked with in the past from another hospital. She left one hospital and went to another, which I'm very grateful for because I worked with this wonderful woman for years. So she knows our family. Yeah. Um, and they're going to do it. So that's, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. It's a big, it's a big thing. And they had no hesitation at all. They were like, yes, we're doing it. Whatever you want. So there is hope out there. You just gotta fight until you find until you find the right people. Yes, I do agree with that because I feel there are good people out there. You just need to find them, mm -hmm. and it's it's just disappointing that you actually have to struggle to find um, people that are actually gonna make that change instead of it being something which is normal. Well, that's the problem. Society doesn't see disability as normal when in reality it is because at some point in our lives, whether it's a temporary mm. or, 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 you know, because of an accident or because you're getting older, disability is a part of everyone's life. Even my glasses, <laughs> me being nearsighted is a disability. I'm protected under the, AD, uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act. That's a disability. That's true, yeah. if you see it that way, I do agree. <laughs> but, um, I mean, I had, I don't know if I told you this when we were speaking, um, but- Your back? Your back? Yes, the back. Okay, the guys, back issue. have to see uh, this. The reason why I knew that Cassandra was an amazing person is because when we spoke, um, I was telling her about all the you know, healthcare things that I've been through throughout my life, and there's a lot. And she was the first person, the first fe Greek female, which is a big thing for me because I've had a lot of negative experiences with um, my community, even though I love them and I'm pr proud of my culture and things like that. But this was huge for me, and I told her that she's my best friend forever. She was able to share her experience with the medical community and say, I know that it's not as severe as yours, but I totally get what you're saying because I went through A, B, and C and it makes sense to me. No one else, no other Greek female has in my 36 years of living has ever been able to do that. So I just said to myself, this woman is amazing. We're best friends. I don't care if she's halfway around the world. And I don't normally have good relationships with females, but yeah, she's awesome. I'm just saying. Oh my God, you're gonna make me cry. 
<laughs> it's true though. I tell you this all the time. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much for that. No, I, I, I love how we met. Like, it's crazy how, I don't know, I think this is my favorite part of all this that I've started with Face the Elephant because usually, I, I mean, I won't just be like, oh, I saw, like, I'm going to put a hashtag and whoever find I'm just going to DM them. Usually I get this vibe from someone and that's how I DM people. And I don't know, I feel like the people that I've met since I've been doing it February, March. So it's pretty new. And I don't know, I think that's the best part. I, I mean, yeah, obviously like educating and awareness, but the people I've met, uh, I, I love that we met. And you're also Greek, so that, that you know, it's <laughs> well, an that's extra why you excitement. <laughs> that's why you messaged me. So guys, I started following her because of Ashley Kelly. And all of a sudden, I, get, I guess she realized that my name was Greek and she messaged me right away. And within hours, we were on, like, an Instagram video. Yes, but, yeah, no. I, I so think, sure. and I think that we're going to find that we're related somehow, too. Oh, uh, well, that's how, that's how Greeks are. We're all related <laughs> in some way, don't they say, so. <laughs> so I just want to give a shout out to one of our viewers, um, Grim AC. He says, a majority of our doctors have a majority of doctors I have seen have never treated a person with CP. That's very true because cerebral palsy is considered a childhood disability. Yes. So with CP, at least in my experience, like I said, anything related to my CP, I've only seen, unless you count the doctors that I went to for second and third opinions, if you don't count those, two in 36 years that's so bad i don't be, I, I i mean it's true but you know i just can't believe that and that's because it's not part of the medical school curriculum and it's not part of the medical school curriculum because there are no questions on the boards about there's like one question on the boards for cp because when you're in med school they teach to the test so if it's not a big part of the test, they're not going to learn about it. That's that's another that's another that's crazy, goal though. of mine. Because but, I mean that's another reason probably that I didn't know about it also because usually we know the basics. So which, the one because it's one of the biggest childhood disabilities. Like we have, I don't know the statistics. I don't, I don't know if Ashley's here, but she would know better than me because I don't know them off the top of my head. But it's a very, there's a large population of people with cerebral palsy in the United States. Very That's large. Probably worldwide. But yeah. it's something that, I mean, I, I, I told you, I didn't know. And I actually look up, look up things that I don't know. Uh, and especially with all this that I've started with Face the Elephant. So I'm, I know it like I've seen it, but I'm not educated on the topic. And that's the disappointing part. And I mean, obviously things are changing because um, I did this other live with this uh, lady, she's in the UK, and she's an author and she does uh, books, for children books, and she's... Um, trying to put them like in school and everything and it's about so the characters all the characters have like disabilities and things which i love i love that because I, I, I love that i love that i find that amazing but the thing is that even for books like that because um beauty mark community i think i i sent you her profile yeah. Uh, she's also doing something with the uh, book which is similar but what i liked is that it doesn't, it, I mean, it gives you the education part of like the awareness, so you get educated. But at the same time, it doesn't focus only on that. So it might be as a story that, okay, yes, this child has, you know, this child is in a wheelchair, but that's not the problem, let's say, you know, the, 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 it would be uh, about something totally different, the story. Right. But the, there are characters in that have disabilities. And that's what I like, because it's not focusing on that. 
And that's how kids learn. Like, I'll give you exactly. an example. Exactly, normalizing it. Yeah, that's how you normalize it. I'll give you an example. Um, <clears throat> so I used to teach Sunday school. And I went into Sunday school for everyone that doesn't know is religion. Um, so I used to teach Sunday school. And one of the classes that I went into, one of the teacher was my mom's friend who worked for the New York City Board of Education. She was a director of vision services for all of the city. So obviously she's going to bring in books that have different people with disabilities. This was like a four-year-old little kid. So I go in and the little boy goes, oh, um, asks me about my disability. So he said, I go, well, I walk with canes and this and that, whatever. And then I show him and goes, can I try? Sure. But be careful. Fine. Whatever. And then it, was, it, it wasn't an issue. We were reading a book and he saw people with disabilities and he's like, oh, what does this mean? What does that mean? You know, someone... With a, with a walking stick, someone in a wheelchair. I explained all that. <clears throat> We're fine. The mother comes in and says, grabs him by the arm and says, I'm going to say it in Greek and then I'm going to say it in English. Because for mm -hmm. me, it has more, yes. more feeling in Greek. Yes. Um, so, get away from her get away from there then in a Kali she's not good grabs him by the arm drags him outside and says stay away from that girl she's she's not good you don't need to be around her mm -hmm. okay. okay and this was this was a young mother this was not an older person but now when this child sees another person with a disability. What is he going to do? Is he going to be run away out of fear and go the other direction or bully? Mm. What are you teaching your child? Children are innocent and they learn through example. If you don't make a big deal about a disability, they're not going to make a big deal. Another story, I have a friend of mine who works in healthcare and nonprofits and things like that. And she has two daughters. First time I went over her house with my mother, the daughters, little girls, the daughters were perfect. Elena, can I help you? Elena, can I do this? Come play with me. Let me move this so that you don't trip over it. Let me take your canes. I think one is 10 and the other one is six. Mm -hmm. I came back home because my mom went with me and she's like, my mom goes to me, what was that? And I go, what? She goes, so-and-so's daughters were fine with you having a disability. I've never seen that in 36 years. I go, yeah, I know. Wasn't it weird? So I called my friend. I'm like, listen, don't take this offensively. And she doesn't because she knows how, like, where I've come from and, you know, what our culture has stained on me. <laughs> Um, and she goes, I go, why were your girls okay with me having a disability? Like, that is the coolest thing ever. <laughs> and she's like, well, because I explained. And they're just fine with it. And I was like, no, but they didn't even blink. Not even a blink. They were just like, it was like I was a, your average person just coming in. And they knew what to do. They knew to move the chair. They knew to pick up the toys from the floor. And these are little kids. So it's, it's what you teach them at home. If you teach your kids that, okay, this person is a human being and they might do things differently and you have to just be aware. How did she know I was safe to pick up this stuff off the floor because I, was, I might trip? Or Elena, pick up your foot because you're, you're going to trip on the carpet. She's six. And literally, like, I went home and I, like, I told my friend, I was like, I cried. She's like, are you serious? I was like, no, but I cried out of happiness, but it was still so weird because I'm so used to having the stares and the questions, and I didn't have that. Mm -hmm. So I said, so thank you for raising your kids that way. I appreciate it. You, like, you have no idea how much that ch changed my perspective on people. I'm like, <laughs> I feel like crying now. <laughs> but uh, 
the first story, like it caused me anger and sadness, like it, you know, mixed feelings when you were saying the first story, because it's what you said, like the kid was just asking things and, and he was like, fine. And then his mom, he... just... but what is he going to do the next time? Exactly, because I saw, I've seen this picture that I really like on the internet, which is, uh, it's like a sketch. I will send it to you after, which is a kid. And he's like, there's another, I think there's another like kid on the floor. So the kid is like, he's bullying him and he's like laughing, pointing, and there's, his tongue is out. But behind him is his mom. So his tongue, like, is, is here, but it's going back and it comes from his mom, his mother's tongue showing what you're saying with the first story that it's not the kid that you should be upset with it's what they are picking up what you are educating them and how you are learning exactly exactly because that's where it all starts from i mean yes you get a lot of the times uh, adults that grew up with parents which weren't that great and they've turned out amazing so you have that also you but do. usually like 90 percent it would be because they've picked up things that they've seen or they've been told. And I mean, obviously we can't be at everyone's house and educate people, but even if we start from schools by having books as such, as I told you, that can actually give that education and that awareness to children. I feel that even if they, they get a negative uh, feedback about someone that let's say is in a wheelchair, if they get the proper education at school, maybe can be like kind of balanced. It can, but also the educators need to be educated because there's been several times in school where I've had teachers tell me that I don't belong there because I do things slower or differently, both in primary school and college. So you also have to educate the educators. Um, there is an amazing program that I had the privilege of being a part of in New York City, and I'm calling out different organizations, that's just me, um, <laughs> on the, um, the Cerebral Palsy Foundation. They have the Just Say Hi campaign where they go into, it's a New York City based, uh, Department of Education collaboration where they do have a curriculum um, to bring awareness of disabilities and start having that conversation in schools. Um, but you got to educate the teachers first. Um, so it's a two-parter. You have the teachers because the teachers have their own biases. And I have a story for that. And then you have the students. So I'll give you an example. I was in a health class in junior high school, which is eighth grade. I was about 15. And the school that I went to had special education downstairs and regular education upstairs. Coincidentally, my sister was in the special ed program downstairs. So we had an adolescent on all fours. Um, so he was talking about disabilities and we we're supposed to pick what, what disability or condition we wanted to do a paper on, right? And coincidentally, someone picked cerebral palsy. Mm -hmm. So he goes, well, cerebral palsy is a birth defect. And an example of a birth defect is Elena and her sister Elizabeth. Because Elena has CP and so does Elizabeth. Now my classmates were in shock. These are kids. Mm -hmm. They just looked at him like, what are you talking about? Like, how can you say something like that? He also went on to tell the girl that if she did, ex if she interviewed me for her paper, she would get extra credit. Now, <laughs> the thing is this though, he was an older man, probably in his 60s, mm -hmm. maybe even 70s. And back then, that's what, that's how they saw a disability. Now, as an adult, and as someone who's been through a lot, and as someone who's not as angry at the world. Now I see it. But when I was 15, I went home crying. That's how he was brought up. So not only do our children need the education, but our teachers and our educators need that education. 
I think everyone does. I just think it needs to be part of, even in colleges, I think it needs to be part of the curriculum. I do agree with that. And the other thing I've said in one of the other, I think it was the live that I did with Beauty Mark is that, you know, if you don't know, just ask. Like, it's it's pretty simple that, I mean, obviously don't offend anyone in any way, but, and, and I feel that people actually, because people with disabilities want people to know and, and spread that awareness. Not everyone, problem, not everyone. So you have to you have to find the people that want it. That's true. <laughs> I know that a lot of people get offended if you ask anything. That's why I'm saying that usually you have to. What yeah, would the... you ask and how you ask it? Right. Can you still hear me? Because my compute my phone says that I've been logged out. No, no, I can hear you fine. Okay. You can see me fine. Yes. Okay. Everything's perfect. Okay. Uh, can you see me and hear me? Yes. We're okay. fine. <laughs> but I don't know. I mean, I, I, I wish I could like change the world. I mean, that's, that's the goal. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I feel that you can make people also, because I went through that phase of trying to make people understand things. Because I have um, someone that I know, which his mother is, you know, she's, I don't think she understands like how disability works exactly. And she has said like pretty mean things about people with disabilities, like, you know, we shouldn't have Paralympics and that why do we have that? Because they're like half, let's say, uh, which is a terrible thing to say. And not only that, other things. And I, the anger that I had with, with that, and I was, I was just thinking of so many ways. I was, I was telling my friends, I was like, maybe I, I could prepare a PowerPoint presentation and take it to her house and like do a whole presentation to her and explain like how things are. And maybe like she would like get to like change things, that, you know, the way that she thinks and sees right. things. But everyone was saying to me that, you know, it's kind of a waste of time because she's like, what? She's like 70 something. She's not gonna change now. You could try. You could try. You know, you wanna know what? I, my, my, my papu, my grandfather, not that he didn't love us and he didn't ex accept us, but he had the, the, and I don't know how to say this in English, the ojto caimeno tizapio cosmos attitude, right? Um, I don't know, Cassandra could probably translate it. Yeah, um, like, you know, all the poor little girls and, you know, what, yeah, what are the people going to say? Because woe is, woe is me, my poor daughter, you know, um, my whole life. That doesn't mean that he didn't love me and he didn't support me and he wasn't there when I had rehab and he didn't love my sister. But it wasn't until, do you know that it wasn't until he got sick? I said, if I, when I was younger, I said, if I could change one person's mind about disability, my work is done. It was not until he got sick with cancer that he first lied down next to my sister and actually like really, really like spent time with her. And then after that, he defended me to one of the community members when I went to him asking him, he was on the board and I said to him, I said, look, my family's part of this church. Mm -hmm. um, and we, my, all my family went to parochial school there and things like that, but my sister and I can't go to that church because there's no ramp. And he said to me, and I was like, and I would love to work with you to figure something out because, you know, everyone deserves to go to church and plus you have a very senior community. And he goes to me, he goes, well, where do you live? And I said, well, I live here and here. He's like, but there's so many churches on your way to get to my church. Why do you have to come to my church? So I said, well, I take the highway here and there are no churches on the highway. And my grandfather freaked out. He goes to me, what you're gonna do <laughs> is you're gonna take this. At that time I was on, I was part of a youth program on a Greek radio station. And he goes, you're gonna take this information. You're gonna write a letter and you're gonna take it to the boss of the radio station and you're gonna bless this 
person on the radio. Oh my god. Yeah. Um, I did. I don't know if he's listening, but Vanasi Kutasi um from Yasbora FM um when he was in New York, he's in Canada now. That's when I <clears throat> um that's one of the places where I learned how to speak <laughs> um to the masses. Um basically blasted him on the radio, printed the, you know, the pictures in the newspaper, wrote a whole big article, did oh a whole God. did a whole thing of me um Eleni Prokora Sefei Olikora Yes um, <laughs> <laughs> it was even it was even at the Proxenia in in New York City, which I didn't know I found out when I went on a college interview for this is all standard, but since we're talking about that when i went on college interview to to um the university of sacred heart at the time the director of admissions was greek and she goes to me you look familiar but i can't in a point where i know you from and i had a portfolio of like all the things that i've done and we opened up that portfolio and once we we turn to that picture she goes that's it and i was like what she goes do you know that that picture of you is in the proxenia and i was just like are you kidding me <laughs> i said what <laughs> she's like that's yeah that's what i know you so <clears throat> yeah so basically i put this guy on blast you know no one in i know you're not familiar but i'm sure you know astoria astoria lo greek no one in astoria spoke to this guy for months he actually went to my grandparents house and knocked on the door and said you have to give me Elena's number because I have to call her and apologize. I mean when I mean no one, no one like everyone turned turned their back. And wow. they and they didn't put a they didn't put a ramp in St. Demetrius, they put a ramp in St. Catherine's, but it's the same community. That's all I wanted. All I wanted was to be able to go to you know church where my mom and my brother and my uncle went to school and to go to my grandpa's and to have my sister be able to go to my grandpa's funeral because I was able to go I could do the stairs so that was <laughs> my first taste of advocacy was within our community so you're here changing the world that was when i was younger that's not now <laughs> yeah but you're still out there doing things as you said for your sister for um you know getting that awareness out there so it's not like you know you did only one thing and that's that's what this world needs like people that are actually going to put that effort in and change the world and make it better for not only yourself but for generations to come to make the new generations have a easier life because it's it's the same for for a variety of topics that the way we are now and we have privileges in i mean we have a long way to go obviously but those privileges are because people actually did something years right. back and of course we have like long long way to go because that was what i mean you saw the live with uh, Ashley you heard what yeah. she said that she went to go in a theater or something, but there wasn't somewhere that she could uh, sit. So where she was, it was like she was blocking uh, people coming Probably in. Probably a, a fire exit. So she was blocking people coming in and out. So she ended up going to someone that she went like, you know, to have fun and enjoy herself to feeling that she shouldn't be there and that, you know, she's in the way of people. Well, the same thing with me when I went to the when I went to the Broxenia, right? Mm -hmm. I had to go with my wheelchair because I wasn't feeling good that day. This was a couple of years back, and I had to have thank goodness my my friend's husband and her dad was was there, and they li literally lifted me, lifted my wheelchair, you know, up the steps, and I could only stay on like a certain floor unless I wanted to walk down the stairs. But places like that are exempt from anything. But it's not. It could be anything because, as you say, yes, it's 
when you want to go to the proxenio and there's like people or bathroom to- the bathroom the bathroom was this narrow so if you were a bigger more voluptuous person mm-hmm. you wouldn't be able to- I don't know how I don't know how you would get in that's the, that's the disappointing thing that um, I don't know how I'm gonna help but I, I will try my best to change <laughs> things <laughs> but I I think of things like that every day if I go somewhere I always like notice things even though yeah I might not have I you know I might not be in a wheelchair or I might not have a disability but I feel people need to actually think of that because that's how we're going to change. You don't have to wait in order to get a disability. You don't have to wait, you know, to have an accident and be in a wheelchair or for you to give birth to a child and for your child to have a disability to be like, okay, I need to do something now because my child is going to end up miserable because they won't be able to do things as other kids. And I feel that is the main problem that it's, it's not our problem. So that's why we won't do anything. Well, there aren't a lot of people like you out there. There might be and I haven't I haven't met them, but there I haven't, I haven't met anyone one with that I'm going to call it an intuition. <laughs> um or or some form of empathetic knowledge. People don't think like that. And even me, honestly, like I said up until the age of 26, I I did do stuff you know, related to disability, but my mom forced me because she's like, you have to learn how to fight for yourself. It was, it was a fight. You have to learn how to fight for yourself. You have to learn how to fight for your sister. And it looks good on a college resume, but you have to learn. You have to learn to open your mouth. I never wanted anything to do with disabilities. And that was because I wasn't there. It wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't at a part in my journey where I was accepting of it. And that's okay. You know, everyone has their own path. Everyone has their own time. And it took me a very a very long time. You know, I had to experience different things like having to advocate for my sister when she got sick and losing her, having to advocate for my grandma when she got dementia, which is a disability. <laughs> Mm-hmm. um and seeing what she went through um when she had to depend on the system for help um both when she was alive and when she was passing hospice was the worst um you know i had to experience those things and i had to be part of that and hands on in order to come to terms with and be okay with and have disability pride and say this is my purpose. That didn't happen fully. Mm-hmm. They both passed away. Elizabeth passed away two and a half years ago and Yaya passed away four years ago. I'm 36. But that's okay. The point is, is that I'm there and I'm talking to you about it and there are people like you out there who want to hear that and help and you know, give people a platform to tell their story because I feel like we learn through sharing. That's how we learn through sharing. You know, I have a disability, I have CP, but when I'm telling you a story, there might be something within that story that clicks and says, "Oh, you want to know what? I can use that." Like, I'll give you an example, my grandma who's in Greece before she went into the nursing home. When she couldn't walk down the stairs, you know what she would do? She remembered when I was a little kid and I used to scoot down the stairs on my butt. And she would say, "Elena, do you know how I got down the stairs today? Do you remember when you were little and you used to do this and this and this? I thought of you and I did it." My grandma doesn't have CP. She hasn't even she didn't even grow up. I didn't even grow up with her. I've seen her 13 times in my life. But she thought about it. She goes, "Oh, this is how Elena does it." Maybe I can do it that way. You know, now that she's in the nursing home, you people don't know what you're talking about. I'm going to call up my granddaughter and ask her because you don't know what you're doing. And she'll call me up and she'll be like, "You know, the physical therapist tried to do this and this and this, but I told them that they were wrong." So good for you, grandma. You're right. They are wrong. You have to do it this way. <laughs> so, you know, 
No, I, I get what you mean, but... As you can learn from sharing. And it's the same thing about, like, the, I mean, and your life and other lives that I've done, is that, you know, you, you learn so much from, as you say, from other people's stories, and you can get educated about topics and, and get that awareness that we don't get. Even though, yes, things are getting better, as we said, with, you know, from schools, from having, because obviously the teachers that are now in school are not the teachers that we had because we don't have that, that big of a age difference. So yes. the teachers, I mean, I remember the teachers growing up and it wasn't great. <laughs> and they could say whatever they want because nothing would happen. I mean, now you can't really do that because Everything laws has... are being placed. Right. <laughs> um, but I remember, because I wasn't really a child that I read in school, I will be honest. <laughs> uh, because I, the thing is, when I was in school, I never had a passion about something. So there's not something I always wanted. Like every month, I wanted something different to study. So I didn't have that urge of like, okay, I want to do this. So I'm going to like study real hard to do it. So because I didn't have that passion, I couldn't like put the effort in to actually right. like read. So I had so many times like teachers, you know, talk bad or, I mean, I wasn't, I mean, you I were a kid really... and you were curious and you got bored and that's okay. Yes. But what it's I'm trying to stop. Yes. But the thing is that if you're not good for teachers, I mean, that when we were younger, people won't bother with you. If, I, if, if you don't get things fast or if you're not, right. uh, yes, they're not going to put the, that effort in. But the thing is that you're a teacher, not because, you know, I can take this textbook and learn it off by heart, get a degree, and then do the same in class. But it doesn't matter. Textbook doesn't matter. It's life experience. Yes. It's experience and being able to apply what you learned in school to help other people. I'll give you another example, another person that really... Um, so teachers weren't my favorite because they always said that I couldn't do something that it wasn't worth it because I did things slower and I didn't get it and this and that, whatever that happened to me, especially in college, because in college I was in pain a lot and I couldn't get to class. And I would say, look, I'm not feeling well. And they'd fail me because I wouldn't come to class. And one summer I was um, registered for a health and communications class with this professor. And he's very open about his disability. He's a big HIV advocate. Um, shout out to Andrew Spielbner, um, who's like my mentor. Um, and I went to him and I said, you're the chair of the department. Do me a favor. Look at my classes and tell me where we can put what because I can, I need to get out of here as quickly as I can. And they're not helping me out. No one's giving me any answers. So we went through my transcript and my courses and he did what he did and I was able to graduate. But he also, I said, hey, I'm taking your class in September and I'm a disability advocate and I've done, you know, I've done <clears throat> a women's health initiative and I've spoken and I raised money and this and that and whatever. And I showed him the video and he's like, all right, I have a section on the syllabus about narrative medicine and people's stories your stories on the syllabus i'm changing it right now when i was in class he would talk about his hiv and disabilities and things like that and then he'd bring me in i was part of the class but he'd bring me into the conversation i guess to teach my classmates and seeing him do that and seeing him treat me the way that he did and always say, you know what, Elena, I know you need extra time, but you're going to do it <laughs> and you're going to get an A because I know you're a kick ass, you know, um, made me realize part of part was part of the reason why I realized that it's okay to have a disability. He even went so far as to my last semester, I purposely took a class with him and he said he knew that I had to take two different forms of transportation to get to school because I wasn't living on campus. And it would literally, the full commute would take me four hours. He goes, you're not coming into class. I go, I'm not. He goes, no, I'm gonna have, there's a couple of students 
in this class that you took my other class with and you're going to talk to them and they're going to they're going to rotate between them and they're going to bring their computers and they're going to Skype you into class. Okay. Really? And he's like, yeah. I was like, are you sure I don't have to run this by the disability office? He goes, no, it's between you and me. I went to the disability office anyway, just to make sure he's, they're like, we have nothing to do with that. It's between you and the professor. You know how many years I was asking professors to do that? And they said no. And now all of a sudden with the pandemic, it's normal and it's okay. And everyone's working from home and everyone's going to school from home. You know how, how much easier it would have been for someone with a disability to just do that? I had a friend who was in college who literally fell on the floor from a seizure. <laughs> and she was like, and the professor saw it. And she was like, I can't come into class, but I can, you know, Zoom or whatever. We have the technology to be able to do it on the computer. Will you consider that as attending the class? And they said no. But why? Okay. That's the thing, though. It's what we said before, that it's not society's problem until something happens and it is. Because it's the same thing with the pandemic. Because as you said, like when you were studying, you weren't allowed to do that, to have... Uh, they didn't allow it. They, they could have. They could. It was up to them. That's it was, what I'm saying. That it was. It, it's a choice. It's not that right. like can't do it. It's a choice. Right. It's because choice. now that the pandemic happened, as you say, everyone's working through Zoom, everyone's taking classes, whether they're in high school or studying something. So it's like normalized now because the pandemic hit everyone. So it hit everyone. It didn't hit just people with disabilities. Right. So it's something that they had to do. But right. if you asked years back you to do that, it's not it's allowed. Not and it's the same. 2015. Yeah, it's not, it's not like it was like, I don't know, in 90, I don't know, 80, I don't know what year. Exactly. So that's, that's what drives me crazy. And that's the things that I want to change because we can make life easier for a lot of people that struggle for everyday life, but it's a choice that we don't. Right. So, so it's not that in general, I don't have the mentality that you can't do something. That's what I always tell my friends. Like if they say to me, I don't know, but you know what? I am 40 years old, let's say, and I want to go, you know, I always wanted to be an, uh, to go to the mall. I'll be like, okay, all right, let's do it. Like, what do you have to do? Like, you have to study for this? Like, do you need to know maths? Okay, study card, learn maths. What do you have to do next? Like, I don't feel anything is crazy and there's no can't in life. Like, if you can change things, you know, you can, there's so many things you can do in this life. And especially to help people, because that's, I feel that's, that's the way things should be in general. To make, to help people, to be, for that humanity, you know, like we're in this life together. Right. We're in this right. planet together. Why, why do we make everything so hard? For, and things, it's, it's not only, as you say, for a class, it's for simple things. As Ashley was saying, just to go to the theater and have a ramp and for them to be specific seats for someone that comes in with a wheelchair. Because if you notice in the, I mean, I don't know in the States, but I've noticed this in Greece. Have I really noticed that in the UK? There's not, why don't you have like, for example, this is like, I just thought of this, okay? <laughs> this is marketing. This is marketing idea, okay? We need to sell this. <laughs> we need to do it. Okay, <laughs> so how the cinema is, okay, you have the chairs. Why don't we have like a line, you know, one side with the chairs or mix them up. I'll mix, mix them up, up better because then it looks yeah. like you're like separate. Right. Yes, like have a chair, have have like space for some of You just have to make sure that it's near an exit though. It's, yeah. Yes, and, and have, you know, have spaces for someone that comes in with a wheelchair, you know, they can put it as a chair, so there won't be any space there for chair, put the wheelchair. Like, I haven't noticed that in Greece for sure, and probably in the UK also. Well, they, they won't do it because it's not mandatory, it's not law. So why would they do it? There's no repercussion. Hmm. So why would they waste their time? No, I know, but it doesn't 
cost anything. Well, I know, but that's how you were raised to think. How was the rest of the world raised to think? <laughs> Can I ask you a question? When you were in school, did you have anyone in your class with a disability? Yes. You did? I did, but I remember when I was in, uh, what's it called, Dimotico. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> so I don't know how old I was, like eight maybe. Uh, so that Montego guys is elementary school. That's the one. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I remember we did have this child, but uh, which unfortunately, unfortunately he he died a few years ago because he got hit by a car. Um, but the thing is that I remember that he was always bullied in 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 the school in general so that's my only experience growing up now what did you do did you talk to him did you yeah i was him? fine with him no oh, okay yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but i mean i don't know like i don't remember in general how i mean i know my parents raised me like fine okay but i don't know how i grew up with like this mentality well, that's what when you were when we first started talking i said what is wrong with you that's what i said <laughs> i said please don't say this the wrong way but what's wrong with you you're not normal <laughs> i love you but you're not normal <laughs> like where did you come yeah. from where have you been my entire life <laughs> yeah i remember that <laughs> But yeah, I mean, obviously they did something right, okay. But I, 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 I just mean that we didn't have that education growing up. That if you saw someone that has a disability, you're like, oh, okay, you know, make fun of them or whatever. And yeah, but it starts from the home. Yeah, it does. It does. Yes, that's true. But like that, my dad in, is, is in his 70s. And he never made fun of anyone. He said there was this one kid with Down syndrome and it wasn't anything that my yes said or did. It just, it was instinctual. And I said, well, maybe that's why you had two kids with disabilities because not to get religious, because God knew that you would take care of them. As a kid, there was this kid that they would make fun of and my dad would defend them and get into trouble. But he would, he would defend the, the kid with Down syndrome, and I said, Baba. And um, I said in English, and then I'm saying Greek, and then English. Baba, what did you feel inside you when you did that? He goes, Tibata, nothing. He's just a human being. And I was like, Yeah, but yeah, yeah, I didn't teach you anything like that. You know, and you're old. You're old, like really, really old school, where like kids with disabilities, it was. You know, you never, you never really saw kids with disabilities because they were hidden or they were in, in hospitals. Mm -hmm. So what went through your head? He's like, I don't remember, but whatever. Like, I, I did what I did. And I was like, well, that's why you have two daughters, you know, with CP. Mm -hmm. That's why we were brought into your life. I mean, he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's... <laughs> He sounds fun. He goes to drive me crazy. And I was like, well, that too. <laughs> uh, but the thing I've noticed in the UK, I mean, uh, in Greece, there's not a lot of places like for, for in general. I mean, even because I work, as I told you, with adults with learning disabilities. But here it's the thing that the government pays a lot of money for, you know, if you have a child with Down syndrome or like autism. They pay a lot here, but then what the parents do is that I've noticed this from, because I have a lot of people that I know in care, and obviously because I'm in care, that they just, you know, leave them at the houses that because there's everywhere care homes here, the government pays for that, and they see them like maybe like twice a year. Like that's the and probably like half of them actually spend their money also living their life. And that's... That's another that's, that's point. Crazy. I've i I'm lucky and privileged enough where my parents gave it their all with both me and my sister, you mm -hmm. know. Because again, we're on, we were on different ends mm -hmm. of the of the spectrum. They did the best that they could, and they're still pushing me. I'm 36, and you know, my dad's like, "What are you doing?" <laughs> you know, 
But um, it's all, and that's a privilege. My life, my life has truly, honestly, been a privilege. I have, you know, experienced things within the system, but not as much as other people in my situation. And I know that, and I take full advantage of it in a way where I can better myself. And through that knowledge and feeling good and doing things, I can help other people. I think that's, that's well, yeah, of course, having that privilege is for sure. In general, having parents that are supportive, um, you know, will be there for you and will back you up. Uh, I think that is a privilege because a lot of people don't have that. So that's amazing. No. I don't know, maybe because they're Greek. <laughs> uh, but I, no, think I think I think it's my parents because a lot of, like I said, a lot of Greek people are, it's, it's hidden, you know, because Greeks don't have problems. You know that, right? We have nothing wrong with us. There's nothing. There's no drugs. There's no mental health issues. There's no disability, nothing. We're, we're perfect the way we are, you know? It's until oh. you pick up the carpet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's, that's another unfortunate, but that's what we have to speak in, for, in the Greek life we do. Yes, we guys, we're that also is a th doing that English is a live and a Greek live. <laughs> yes, no, yes, we said that we're gonna do a Greek live. But I will say that, that yes, Greek people, even though they're really, the families are really close, and it's They're very nice. And very like, I don't know how to say philoxeny in English. Welcoming? Yes, very welcoming. There you go. There, that, that makes <laughs> That's the <a> one. <laughs> uh, you see, it's there you go. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, but even though that's something which is very nice growing up, because I've noticed in the UK that that's not a thing. Like families are like, okay, go, it's 18, off you go now. Goodbye. Right. Yep. All right. Uh, but yeah, so that's very nice to have. But at the same time, is that what are people gonna say if, like, I don't know? It's it's Tita B, it's Tita Pio Cosmos. <laughs> Always. <laughs> Always. What are people gonna say? And as you say, you know, Greeks don't do drugs, no disabilities, everything is solved. And We're perfect. <laughs> and uh, it comes from Greeks and we're perfect. <laughs> There you go, no problem. I don't know what we're going to speak in a Greek life. Uh, <laughs> but what I want to ask you as a last question, uh, what would you like to see in society in general as a change? I mean, obviously, as you said, um, you know, just to make life easier in a lot of ways, as you say, to even, it's, even if it's going to the cinema. But what else would you like to see as a change in society? Well, or what... Think... Sorry for interrupting you. And what like people can do in general to help also so it's two questions okay so um what do i like to see um normalize disability don't be afraid of it don't be afraid to ask you know you can ask the person and if a person doesn't want to answer you that's their right mm -hmm. but by learning we normalize and and understand that disability which it was hard for me to to realize disability disabled not a bad word it's not a bad thing it's part of life for everyone it's just that some of us come to it a little earlier than others and the things that we're asking for are a human right and a lot of the things that we're asking for will make your life easier too it's not just about us. It just like you're gonna tell me a curb cut isn't gonna make it easier for just simple. But a curb cut isn't gonna make it easier for a mother with a baby carriage, a ramp, an elevator. What do we have to do? We have to have that conversation. And it's okay to have that conversation. It's 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 not a scary thing, whether it's about physical disabilities, mental disabilities. You have to be willing to have that conversation and be open. Both for people who don't have disabilities and for people who do. But you have to do it in a respectful way. Mm -hmm. You know, and if someone says, I'd rather not answer that question, 
respect it. But that's not going to happen until society realizes that disability is a part of life and it can affect anyone at any age and any time. It's not just people who were born with disabilities, people who were car accidents. It can happen. I, my mom could walk out the door and trip and break her foot. And guess what? She has a disability. Maybe for a couple months. Right. I'm the tipaxilo on the chair. But, she, but it's for a couple months, but it's still a disability. But you need to be willing to have those conversations and be open-minded and teach our youth that disability isn't scary, where people too, you know? And it's not a bad thing. We're people. So talk to us. Say hi. How are you? What's up? How's it going? Um, what can you do? Just treat us like the human beings that we are. And if you have an opportunity to write to a government official for something that you know, is, is, you know, up in your government, like in the United States, um, there, there's a thing for social, social security. What does it take you to copy and paste a letter and put your name on it and send it in an email? Show support that way, you know, or, or get funding. The biggest, you know, the National Health Institute has no funding at all for cerebral palsy. There's no research. There's no money there at all. I didn't know that. In the budget. I didn't either. <laughs> um, again, go to the website, go to yourcpf.com. There's a, there's a format of a letter if you want to change it around because you have a loved one with CP or another disability. If you want to change the wording, go ahead. There's a link to some you know, there's a link to find out who, who your legislator is and send an email. When you see a person with a disability, ask them if they need help. If they don't need help, fine. Don't help them. Some people don't like help. Some I people are on that old and he just lost it. <laughs> yeah. Some pe I was like that, you know, um, respect that because they're, they're going through, you don't know what people are going through. Just like, I don't know what you're going through, so don't judge. Ask. Don't assume, ask. Be willing to have that conversation. Be willing to learn. Be willing to sit down with your kids and say, you want to know what? There's people in this world that don't walk the way that you do, that need a little extra help. That doesn't mean that they're scary. You can still be friends with them. They're awesome people. Just be human. Treat others the way that you want to be treated. That's what it is. And do things that can help other people that take two seconds. Because it will come back full circle. I believe. I believe in karma. And when you do something good, you get something in return, eventually. I think it's what you're saying that, you know, as you say, just ask. If you don't know something, you can ask. You can Google it. I mean, we live in 2021. You can find anything on the internet. Right. Of, well, instead of looking if, I don't know what, but, you know, anything weird. I mean, you can look up that also. But, I mean, you know, why don't, you know, people don't take advantage that we live in the era that we do and you can learn so many things just by you. No, they're just worried about likes. They're worried about likes and follows. That's it. Which I know, but that's, that's crazy. Your online though. persona. This conversation you... that we're having now is real. It's online, but it's real. That's the thing. And that's, what, that's another thing that I want to, know. Uh, like, as a goal for, for Face the Elephant is that, you know, you can use social media for a positive thing, to spread that awareness, to educate people, to help people. Because you never know who's going to see this live and how they're going to help them. Right. And, and that's the thing that social media can do so, so many amazing things, but it, the 90%, let's say 80, okay, 
is about, you know, how many followers or how many... I mean, I've been turned down, turned down for lives because I didn't have enough followers, which is crazy. Which, at the same time, it's, it's good because I'd rather have someone that actually wants to come and, and spread that awareness and, and share the story and share it for the right reasons. So, but it's all about that in the society that we live nowadays. It's all about what you look like. Yes, for sure. But anyway, not to... to <laughs> that's a lot of time. <laughs> but... Yes, as you say, just ask. And if you see someone, I mean, like, it, it doesn't have to be someone with disability in general. If you see someone that needs help, just ask. And that's another story that uh, Beauty Mark was saying at her life, that because she has a limb difference and she has three children, I think, it doesn't really matter. But she was holding one of them when they were a baby and, and she went to get something from the, from the supermarket and something dropped. So, she, so a lady ran up and took her child off of her because, like, to help, I mean, yes, right. the good thing was there, but you don't do that. It's right. the yes. way you do it. Yes, because she obviously got, like, really offended. You can't go and grab someone's child because you see they have a limb difference. I could be in the supermarket and drop something. No one's going to run up to me. Right. But because it's a visible disability, that's the first thing that she thought to do. But that's, like, totally disrespectful. Right. So it's or all or it's, actually because she didn't want the child to be hit by something. So it was just an automatic safety thing. But yeah, but that's the thing that that's what she's saying that there wasn't any danger at all. She was just holding it. So okay. Real, right. Right. So she was just trying to. If you see the light, yes, she says the story. But it's all a way. It's all about the way that you you ask and say things, and how you approach people without mm -hmm. offending them. And you can do that. I mean, anyone can do that. And yes, that's, that's what I want to say. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, uh, thank you so much for today. Those are my questions. I have much more, which I haven't asked, but you owe me another life, so. <laughs> I owe you another life. <laughs> and you owe me, you have to send me this life. Um, does anyone have any questions? Because I saw that people joined. Uh, I don't know. Yes, if you have any questions, send them. Anna would like you to say, what was your idea? Because oh, I absolutely so, love okay, it. So my idea was um, because Cassandra and I are both in the experimental, um, <laughs> the experimental mode of our both our platforms. I would like you to give either message me or Cassandra um, and tell us what you took away from this live, like one or two statements. Mm -hmm. of what you took away from this live and if you would like us to share them on our platform we will if you don't you know we won't um just let us know but again what were a few takeaways from this live and how would you like us to do things differently if you want us to do it differently but again what did you get out of our conversation and was it helpful I'm sure it was helpful. But yeah, the thing, yeah, so anyone that sees the live after, obviously, I don't know who's in now, but whoever sees it, even if you see it like, I don't know, two weeks from now, a month, you can still DM us. Uh, yep, whatever. Yeah, whatever. I'm, I'm going to put up, I'm going to put up a couple of things that I hoped that you got out of the live. And I think um, Cassandra's going to do the same just mm -hmm. so that we can give them an example but definitely just send us a message even if it's one thing one thing that you a take away from the lives and that's it yes and i would like to thank you so much for doing this well thank, thank you, so you for having me <laughs> thank you for coming and sharing your story is <laughs> stories it wasn't just <laughs> one story it was a variety which that's that's what i love and that's what i was telling you when we had the conversation before the live because yes we had so many topics but I've prepared like questions in front of me and I've asked you like two of them because <laughs> that's the thing there's there's a flow and and that's what I love well, with people. conversation exactly like, exactly okay. that's that's the thing uh, so thank you I appreciate your time and that you shared your story on my platform it means a lot I to appreciate me. you and I appreciate 
your platform and that you were willing to listen and have the conversation with me because that's what we need more of. And guys, she's awesome. So whoever's not following her, go follow her. Um, I'm going to try to get it to the US because we have to meet in person. Um, yes, I am up for that. And <laughs> we, we will get there. I'm telling you, especially now that things are getting back to normal. We have We have things to change there, okay? <laughs> we have things to change in the U.S. And then we have to change them in Greece. There you go. <laughs> are, wait, are you go wait, are you going back to Greece or are you staying in the U.K.? Because my grandma said that they're closing everything now. The numbers are going up. Well, don't tell me that because I'm going, in, <laughs> uh, I'm going first of September. So I'm hoping I'm actually going to go. Okay. Okay. Well... <laughs> Tell your yaya to, to send all her positive... Yayades, you know, grandmothers in Greece, they are like, you know, they know if they put like positive or negative, it's gonna come out. So tell her to send all her... <laughs> well, where are you gonna be? You're gonna be in Thessaloniki? Because she's right... She's in Kabbalah, so she's right there. She goes, there's nothing in Kabbalah. It's all on the other island. Kabbalah and Thessaloniki are fine. That's what I want, Thessaloniki. Tell her to keep Thessaloniki for me until September. I need to go. <laughs> well, my dad wanted to come on the live and meet you. I was like, no, daddy. No, no, no. We're going to do a private one. But, but why not? No, dad. Sorry. Why? You should tell him. If he's there, you should tell him to come and, and wave so we can see. No, him he's tonight. not here. He's downstairs. I'm not going to come. <laughs> Well, send my regards. Thank you so much again for today. And stay tuned because we have part two in Greek. Yes, we do. <laughs> Thank also, you so much. We like you. Bye. We like you. Bye.